Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Uh, thank you for joining. My name is Amadou Jalo. I'm one of the Lions and Falcons of DHL. That means we are part of DHL Global Forwarding Mayor. And we are taking this opportunity A, to appreciate that you have been engaged with us throughout the year. We're taking this opportunity as well to directly, virtually engage with you because, as you know, you know, with the impediment of COVID-19 across all the globe, you know, we, we haven't been able to physically engage. So we decided to use a product of DHL, it's called DHL Trade Fair and Events, uh, that have set up all these tools that you have today to be able to have a virtual engagement with you. So what will be our engagement uh, type or, you know, subjects this week? We'll be talking about many different things. Um, the first thing that we'll be talking about, you know, we have a booth uh, that we'll be talking about Saludo. Saludo is our digital marketplace that we have rolled out across Middle East and Africa to enable people that are using trucks and people who need them uh, to engage with the virtual tool uh, without us moving and touching papers. Uh, that is something that is a revolution that has started in Europe and that we have rolled out across all of our region. Um, we'll be talking about industrial projects. You know, we have a lot of infrastructure projects across all the region. So you'll have a boost that is talking about what are the capabilities that are building up to be windmills, uh, ele electrical uh, power plants, um, you know, oil and energy, boring platforms, all these infrastructure that we work on. You will have a boost that is demonstrating our, our capabilities in that area. You will have a boost that is talking about uh, DGF Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is the largest market in the Gulf, and, and besides going there for the Hajj, I think that it is a pretty good place also to go for business, and then we'll be helping you understand how do we connect Saudi Arabia to the rest of the globe and make sure that Vision 2030 becomes a reality. And lastly, you know, we just won four Gold TV Awards for an initiative that is really lying into in, in my heart for personally uh, for our Women in Leadership program, which is around sisters in the region. So we really think that it is important that not only us, but all of our suppliers, partners, and everybody in government work towards having empowered sisters across all of our region, and therefore we'll be sharing you know, knowledge and systems and processes that we have put in place to put vision into practice in terms of putting women and sisters in leadership in our own organization. That is what we call women in DG at DGF. So today, uh, just right after my presentation, um, you know, we'll be talking about automobility. Why is automobility important? So we don't talk about automotive, we talk about mobility, but with autos, yeah? So why is it important? It's because we have roughly around 1.3 billion people in Africa that need to move around. You know, with a new ag agreement that they have signed in Addis Ababa, people want to be able to move and connect between the different countries. So we'll need a lot of vehicles, but we'll need a lot of smart and sustainable vehicles to be able to do that. We will need a lot of intelligent vehicles to do that. That is what we'll be talking about in terms of automobility. In the Gulf, you know, we have roughly around 16.2 million passenger vehicles that move around. And with IoT, you know, and all these new technologies uh, that we have in place, these cars will not be just limited to being cars, it will be cars that are engaging, uh, connecting, and improving lives across all of this vision. And it is important for us to understand what are the key trends. So, and to that effect, we have today, you know, just right after my presentation, we'll have a friend of DHL called Subash Joshi. He comes from Frost and Sullivan. He will be talking about Frost and Sullivan view because they do research, market research in that area. And right after him, you'll have Fatih Plati. Fatih Tlati is a Belgian Tunisian, so he comes from our region, he's a lion as well. Uh, he's the president of automobility at DHL, and then he'll be talking about his perspective, you know, as a global president of aut automobility uh, in DHL, you know, of how these mega trends apply to what we see in terms of logistics. The idea is to make sure that everybody in our region, so be you in Saudi Arabia, in Turkey, or in South Africa, or in Madagascar, that everyone in our region also get an access to automobility and be able to move goods, move people, because borders are opening so that we can enable trade. Thank you very much. Enjoy all the sessions, enjoy the virtual tour. I hope you'll have fun like I will. Uh, thank you on behalf of all the Lions and Falcons of the very good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My presentation today will focus on key trends impacting the Middle East and Africa mobility industry. Before I start with my presentation, a very quick introduction about myself. My name is Subhash Joshi. I'm Vice President and Regional Head uh, for Middle East and Africa at Frost and Sullivan. I also head the mobility, mobility practice within the organization. 
I come with more than 15 years of industry research and consulting experience and been working with many industry stakeholders across the region in developing their long-term growth strategy and developing their e-commerce and digitalization uh, platforms, also doing a lot of competitive market intelligence, M&A, IPO and CDD advisory. My today's presentation will focus on five key pointers, the economic outlook, uh, the automotive industry in the MEA region, an overview about it, as well as key disruptive trends which is impacting the industry in a big way, which will be supported by the relevant case studies, and finally, the conclusion and way forward. Well, when we talk about economic outlook, we cannot talk about it without uh, talking about the COVID-19 impact. When we look at the COVID-19 impact, 2020 is definitely uh, a, a global recession uh, which, which uh, has uh, impacted the, the global economy. When we look at the impact of any recession, we look at the depth of the recession as well as we do look at the length of the recovery, the time period it is going to take to recover. We are expecting about 3 to 5 percent decline in global GDP and about 18 to 24 months time to uh, recovery to happen. But the important point here, which you will see, that the, the Eurozone or the United States is definitely in deep recession. However, when we talk about the Asia Pacific, the China, and some part of South Asia, they are in much better position with only three to 5% decline in GDP. When we specifically talk about Middle East, Middle East had impact of COVID-19 as well as of lower crude oil prices which definitely had more negative impact on uh, Middle East GDP. However, the government incentives or the stimulus packages which is announced by many regional government bodies has supported industry to recover. We have already seen some recovery happening in UAE, in Saudi Arabia, and we are expecting a more faster recovery in Q2 and Q3 2021, which is impacting all the industry, including the mobility one. One point I wanted to highlight here, the GCC as a region is more uh, uh, strong fundamentally because they have focused on creating a multi-sector economy by 2030 by concentrating on manufacturing industry as well as sectors like infrastructure, construction, retail, tourism and financial services. The planning stage is over for them. They are looking at implementing what has already been planned, which is beyond oil, developing industries which are not only dependent on oil revenue, but also localizing many other industries, which also includes automotive. With this, I will move to my next section where I will talk about the MEA automotive industry overview. The structure which I'm going to follow in this section is I will talk about Middle East, specifically GCC and Turkey. Yes, we include Turkey as part of Middle East. And then I will quickly go into Africa, talk about eight countries which are really making difference when it comes to automotive and mobility industry. And then talk about Morocco, uh, which has really established itself in the overall uh, mobility ecosystem and developed a very advanced value chain. Starting with GCC, when we talk about GCC, uh, GCC is the largest automotive market in the Middle East and expected to see growth in demand for both new and used car as well as the independent aftermarket. It's mainly driven by recovering uh, economic condition, increasing per capita income as well as ongoing construction activity. Couple of key highlights uh, on this slide is basically uh, we have seen uh, Saudi decision to allow women to drive in 2018 that has led in increased female drivers. We are expecting m more than 3 million female drivers to uh, add into driving population. All of it won't translate into new and used vehicle sales, but at least 50 to 60 percent of those new licenses will impact the new and used vehicle sales. The second point here is the way the distribution structure is changing. The auto part distributors and wholesalers, they are finding new channels of customer engagement, such as online sales channel, as well as spare parts channels, which is providing product directly to the customer. So the structure, which is conventionally been three tier and four tier structure is becoming more customer centering where the goods and product and services can be supplied and delivered to them at their convenience of home or offices. 
we have already seen changes uh, where the customers are moving away from the agency repair, especially on the quick service side, because the independent aftermarket structure is becoming more and more organized. We have more organizations who are offering these services by keeping customer as at the center stage of providing them convenience. You can book your service online, the service center guy will come to your place, pick your car, service it and drop it off. That is what is changing in the region drastically. Apart from that, we have already seen the uh, Saudi government, Abu Dhabi, Oman and most of the countries in GCC is moving towards localizing the spare part ecosystem. They are enabling the investment by many manufacturers and they already have a plan of localizing the ecosystem for aftermarket parts and slowly it is going to move towards OEM manufacturing and assembling in near future. Uh, we, have all, we have also seen the dominance of certain OEMs. It's been always a Japanese OEM dominance market and it moved to Korea. Now we see dominance of Chinese companies. One brand, Shangin, has already become among the top 10 brands in Saudi Arabia. And that is impacting the way the supply chain is getting developed for Chinese brand, their products, their aftermarket products and accessories. I would also likely, uh, I would also speak uh, specifically about Turkey, which is a strong production and engineering hub and a high level of integration with global automotive value chain. Turkey is now the largest light commercial vehicle manufacturer in Europe as well as in Middle East. We have seen commit from, commitment from Hyundai Motors, FCA and Toyota, Toyota Motors who continue to invest in Turkey with increased production capacities. Turkey, which has always been an assembly based production, is gradually becoming an industry with R&D design capabilities and high added value. Uh, it's not only home of conventional vehicle manufacturers, but Turkey, uh, uh, recently they have uh, locally developed electric car by TOG, which is Turkey Automotive Joint Venture Group, and they will produce five different platform by year 2030. Turkey has abundance of uh, effective, skilled, and cost competitive labor focus. Uh, labor force makes Turkey as a favorite destination for automobile manufacturing. Again, when we talk about a larger Middle Eastern and African uh, uh, automotive infrastructure and mobility space, we also include the lot of effort which are made by local government to localize the entire value chain. And there are eight such examples on this particular side of many African countries because African automotive market is expected to see a stable growth in the coming years due to economic stability, rising Middle East, uh, rising middle class population, investment in infrastructure and strong auto policies developed to in incentivize auto manufacture are some of the key highlights. Countries from South Africa to Rwanda to Ghana to, to Tanzania to Nigeria to Morocco all have geared up to develop local automotive industry. The key three example here is South Africa, the Morocco as well as Nigeria because five to six years back we have seen many policy changes in Nigeria which introduced 35 plus 35 percent import duty and that has enabled in development of many SKD plants in the country. Now the localization is moving towards CKD plants and that's where we will see more efforts are being made by other African countries. We have example of Rwanda which has introduced 10 year tax free regime. Similarly Ghana which has introduced 10 year tax free breaks uh, as well as 5 year tax break of companies venturing into partial manufacturing. And Morocco has been classic example which I will cover in my next slide because Morocco has developed itself as one of the, as one of the key player and supply hub of passenger cars in European as well as in African market. It is preferred destination for localized auto manufacturer due to lower cost attractive incentives offered by industry and close proximity and access to European markets. Morocco has signed numerous free trade agreement with, with European unions, United States, as well as they are signing new agreement with Middle Eastern and African countries as well. When we talk about uh, Morocco, the automotive industry has been able to generate 85,000 new jobs between 2014 and 2018, which has 
develop the total potential of this industry in terms of job creation to about 158,000. Uh, Morocco has well established itself on the passenger car production uh, ecosystem. Now government is specifically working in developing similar uh, strategy or s implementing similar strategy for the commercial vehicle and we will see development of light commercial vehicle to medium and heavy commercial vehicle in near future and Morocco becoming a supply hub not only for European side of the market but as well as for a larger African continent. With this I would like to move to my next section which will talk about the key disruptive trends which is really disrupting the way the automotive industry or mobility industry functions because it's been very conventional in Middle East and Africa region. However, these trends have changed the way the industry has been functioning. To quickly start with, I'm going to talk about uh, mobility as a service. We know that mobility as a service has been developing in many countries globally and many people are not aware what is the impact of mass in Middle East and Africa region. So I'm specifically going to cover mass in Middle East and Africa. When I talk about Middle East and specifically GCC, we have seen companies like eCar, U-Drive, Kareem Bike, who has made the uh, customer journey to commute from point A to point B much more convenient. Companies like eCar, which offers pay per minute service, allowed users to drive and pay by minutes, serving almost 50,000 monthly booking across UAE in 2019. The journey through U-Drive and eCar grew by almost 103% and that did not stop even during the COVID impact time because they have offered specific services to end customer and rather than buying the vehicle, they were more convinced in using eCar and U-Drive services for point A to point B commute. It is not only limited to the GCC or the Middle East region, but in Africa, mass in Africa has been redefined from product innovation to commuter experience to data-driven decision making. One of such example is Volkswagen Mobility Solution in Rwanda, which offers ride hailing and corporate car sharing services through mobile app and innovative IT solution. Similarly, Moza Ride, which is a mass provider, is connecting informal modes of transportation in the Ivory Coast, such as shared taxis and minibuses. There are over 17,000 users and 600 uh, drivers enrolled in the city through a mobile app and a smart card solution. Similarly, we have example of cashless tap and go payment system initiative for conventional buses like uh, Kigali in Rwanda. So it is not only developing on the Middle East landscape, but we have many example of mobility as a service getting developed in many African countries. I would also like to touch upon a new service which is not new for many countries globally but in the region it is it is well picked up over last two years. I am talking about vehicle subscription as a service where a customer has an option of taking a vehicle as a subscription package and changing it over a period of time. So we call it also flexi leasing. In Middle East we have seen companies like selfdrive.ae, Karasti and Invigo who, who have launched as well as launching new platform to provide such services. Self-Drive, they have launched vehicle subscription services in 2019 with fleet of 2000 cars across UAE. Similarly, Invigo, they, they are serving about 1000 car subscription uh, customers since its launch and certainly catering to the UAE market. Now they are also expanding in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain and more Middle East and African countries. It's just not the third party. OEMs and large distribution group, they are also getting um, engaged with this third party to find out a solution where they can bring their new cars and used car on such platform to provide a very convenient point A to point B journey to the end customer. When we talk about the disruptive trends, we have to talk about the changes which has happened in online retailing because from a transaction based model towards an experience based approach leveraging digital technology has been the key trend during the COVID time and this is going to continue in near future as well. We are talking about concepts like feature stores, omnichannel re retailing, connected retailing, new business model which is also supporting in development of digital KPIs and when we talk about uh, the retailing, the future retailing which is digital we have one example in the region and I will talk about that in the case study section where the customers now are being able to buy vehicles from the comfort of their house. They do not have to step out 
they can buy the vehicle by sitting at their home and vehicle is getting delivered to them at the convenience at their home. So all these things which were very conventional in Middle East and Africa region, we never had such example in past, those are changing. And I was talking to one of the CEO last month and he was actually thanking COVID for those changes rather than thanking their uh, uh, chief technology officer CTO because COVID has really changed the way the, the customer journey is been considered by the conventional players in the market. I would like to discuss some of the case studies here. So I will quickly start with a case study of GeForce, uh, which has uh, uh, really redefined this space, how the vehicles are getting sold and how the after sales services are getting bought by the end customer. Very few KPIs here I would like to talk about. If you look at the, uh, the GeForce case study, the, it's an online platform where they've been able to bring the automotive dealership sales journey to online where customer can go, review the vehicle, select the vehicle, order it, process their loan, buy the vehicle and vehicle is getting delivered at their home. In UAE, we have seen 25% of transaction happen outside the dealer's working hours. So all the review, all everything happened in, during the night time when the dealership, when the showroom was closed. In Q1, 2020, online sales were equal to the entire 2019, where now these platform, they enable 100% uh, loan processing at, from the convenience of your home. And one of the vehicle which was sold through this entire online journey, the value of the vehicle was more than 400,000 dirham, about $110,000. For one of the dealership, 95% of the cars they sold, used car, were online in the month of April. Now, nowhere we are saying the entire journey or the, the most part of the journey will happen online because Middle East and Africa region is, is still require touch and feel, the test drive option. So we are saying the journey is starting online where most of the decision and selection is happening online. The customer will still come to the showroom, fill the vehicle, test drive it, but it will be concluded online because you don't have to be inside the showroom for the loan processing. It can happen online and the vehicle can be delivered to you. So that is, that is what is changing. That is what is, uh, that's where the customer is more interested to have that convenience where they were using the conventional way of buying vehicles and buying services earlier. With this, I would like to move to my next case study, which is about Hoover Bike, specifically about Dubai Police. Uh, uh, they, they got uh, uh, the first production ready Hoover Bike. The S3 was delivered to Dubai Police back in November 2018. They already started training their personnel to use the S3 with support from two dedicated trainers from Hoover Surf. Uh, the, uh, once they have a steady demand, it will be deployed mainly for the surveillance and first response scenarios in the city, but it is not going to be restricted for Dubai police only. In future, it will be uh, introduced for civilians as well, who can actually utilize the vehicle for mobility, for, for going to point A to point B. Dubai has already tri trialed a lot of uh, flying urban vehicles. One of such example is Volocopter, which has developed an air taxi station concept, which can cater to 10,000 passengers each day. We have example of Volocopter, which, uh, which we call air taxi station or Volo Hub, that facilitates landing and takeoff and close boarding and deboarding points, protecting passengers from inclement weather, parking lot, charging and battery swapping facility. It's a mass transit uh, point based solution where it can enable the takeoff and land in every 30 seconds. There are a lot of trials which are going on for even Airbus flying taxi concept, uh, which will enable multiple people to travel at the same time rather than individual traveling in one vehicle. So all those have already been trialed and it is going to become reality soon. And there are many cities, including Neom City in Saudi Arabia, which are going to deploy such, commuting, such commute method in future. With this, I will jump to my final slide, very specific two, three points on this slide. Now, uh, we have seen the changing automotive landscape in GCC. The changes are mainly coming from the perspective of the customer convenience, the the uh, reduction in the money which most of the distributors and dealers are making on their bottom line. And that's where 
the new technologies, the new ways of selling vehicles, selling parts are coming up. If I talk about GCC as an example, then the profitability which is uh, which was in more than double digit more than double digit in last 3 to 4 year had de have declined to almost 3 to 4% so they are trying to remove the three tier or four tier structure and supplying product directly to the customer so they can earn more margin and that require changes the way the supply chain is functioning today because last mile connectivity product getting delivered directly to the directly to the end customer all of that is becoming important on the other hand, the customer wants convenience. They don't want to spend time in service center. They don't want to spend time in local sanayas. They want services to be delivered at their home. And that's where companies like Open Bonnet, companies like Service My Vehicle, they are enabling this journey where customer conveniently is customer convenience is being considered and customer is able to buy product, service their vehicle as per their requirement. When we look at the African automotive landscape, it is more towards localizing the uh, automobile ecosystem and developing the local value chain. But at the same time, they are also investing a lot in developing the mass transit system. We have a couple of examples in the, in the presentation. However, the more focus will be given in redefining that journey as well as developing the entire ecosystem for the automobile manufacturing. So that would be the last slide of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and have a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure today to share with you some automobility trends and their logistics implication. In these times of crisis, we see that uh, we have to care about immediate challenges like the shutdown of a global supply chain or at least the partial shutdown, the struggle for service and business continuity, uh, the importance of remaining agile in a transitory phase, but at the same time we need to get ready for the full EV world and the logistics related to it as well as the enablement of the development of shared mobility. And we also importantly need to balance cost and resiliency for automobility supply chains. In uh, the last times, and uh, especially several months ago, we went through an unprecedented crisis for global logistics. At its peak, the COVID-19 crisis had a major impact on uh, logistics networks with the loss of 83% of passenger belly capacity uh, due to the shrink and then meant a shrinking of air freight and ocean freight capacity with the medical cargo uh, prioritized and raised for capacity. It meant also uh, globally, regionally and locally uh, uh, border crossing challenges with varying country regulations and uh, this congested uh, logistic infrastructure was also driven by a, a very important uh, rise of e-commerce where there were more than 50% orders in Q1 and that continued afterwards. So that means that uh, COVID-19 has definitely disrupted global automobility supply chains with uh, widespread lockdowns where more than half of the world population went at different times on lockdowns and maybe now coming again towards these kind of situations with a slowdown in manufacturing uh, that really fell uh, by 40% in Q2 compared to 2019 and having different situations uh, the last times with a shortage uh, in, in supply uh, due also to parts shortages coming from China and some other uh, locations uh, and, and of course a catch-up effect now and an adaptation to new global trade rules with the fluctuations in demand and trend conditions. Uh, it meant that uh, automotive companies switched uh, supply strategies with minus 37% air freight volumes in Q2. Uh, when you see all this, you realize that uh, most of the supply chains are 
mostly organized in terms of uh, cost minimization for automobility. Uh, that means offshore sourcing, just-in-time delivery and lean inventory, the production shift to low-cost countries. And in these times, uh, there is, of course, a need for cost minimization, but an important uh, need for resilience maximization. And, uh, and there, we talk more about local sourcing, distribute safety stock enabled by central visibility, flexible and diversified production and sourcing. So, which is more the new normal, as we can say. Importantly, when such a pandemic happens, it's important to bring the industry back to normal post-COVID-19 situation. And the first phase that we've seen was mostly to reboot the global automobility supply chains in terms of coordination of the supply rebound ahead of vehicle assembly uh, uh, and also the importance to reassess inventories, to reposition vessel trucks, fleets and, and equipment for phased restart, uh, as well as adapting the production planning to logistics and plant safety constraints. Then this was really important uh, in the first phase. Then we started now the last times to uh, see what we could call the redesign of a transitory setup that will match the new constraints and where we would uh, evaluate the mid-term prices impact on the supply and demand, adapt the current logistics setups uh, and uh, offer better granted services if possible, as well as design efficient logistics processes compliant with COVID-19 safety measures. And now we talk more than ever about that when we see a second or third wave of the epidemic uh, coming and several associates uh, not being able to come to work because of the situation. Then uh, still, it is important to prepare the new normal in the automobility logistics in terms of uh, new vehicle platforms for electric vehicles, long-term supply chain redesign and rationalization, strong demand and volume fluctuations that could be accepted be expected because there will be an important catch-up. This means that there are trends that are getting reinforced by the crisis and we can see at least four of them. One of them is the importance uh, of uh, electric vehicles and uh, due to uh, government supports for cleaner energy and the requirements of customers for uh, cleaner energies, cleaner environments, uh, and, and that should, could represent up to 30% of the sales uh, of some automobility players by 2025. Uh, second important trend is the development of new sales and vehicle usage modes uh, that would mean uh, transport sharing, uh, sharing networks. Uh, of course, we have at the moment 60 to 70 decline in the ride hailing, but this will definitely rebound. However, we see uh, other requests uh, to decrease the cost per mile savings uh, by uh, using uh, logistics uh, as a service, uh, for example. We see also the rise of e-commerce where uh, still uh, um, an important um, uh, number of customers are asking for uh, potentially purchase cars online, uh, up to 50% in, in some countries like China, and also having the online uh, spare parts sales increasing, and that could represent 10 to 15% uh, in uh, uh, 2020. And a fourth important trend is how to balance cost efficiency and supply chain resilience, as we've seen also previously. While a vast majority of the companies continue to view cost as a top priority, rightly, 50% of the companies, they intend to diversify production and suppliers and, and caring more about uh, the resilience of the supply chain. Now, these trends have, of course, important meanings for logistics. When we talk about electric vehicles, it, will, it means managing the battery flows and infrastructure, 
uh, it means also uh, uh, having more dangerous SKUs like batteries and also caring about the second life replacement and recycling logistics related to that. When we talk about uh, uh, new uh, models and new vehicle usages, it means the development of fleets uh, uh, activities and logistics uh, in, when we talk there about innovative aftermarket services like predictive maintenance, uh, where we can forecast you know, the potential failures on time. Uh, it means also uh, heavily utilized shared uh, vehicles maintenance, and it means also the online ordering and home delivery. This leads to uh, the trend related to aftermarket and, and e-commerce emergence with the more redesigned, uh, warehoused uh, and last mile transportation setups with the smaller shipment quantities and the uh, right service levels uh, related to direct delivery uh, to customers because customers uh, get more and more demanding and that's important. Now we can see that these days Customers accept some delays, but it's important to notify them. And that's really uh, important, hence important digitalization there. And in the middle of all this, the importance to balance cost efficiency and supply chain resiliency uh, in terms of more near shoring, as we had seen it already uh, before the pandemics, uh, increased uh, digitalized operations, leveraging better analytics and, of course, shared distribution networks, uh, which uh, drive the cost down. Now, when we think of these trends, uh, we've uh, talked, of course, of electric vehicles. That means that uh, we will see uh, uh, much more new electric vehicle model launches, model launches until 2025. That will mean caring for lithium battery transportation, warehousing and life cycle management. It means caring about uh, the prototype parts movements that also mean designing better inbound to manufacturing networks and ramp up management of these activities. Special also moves management for launch and promotion events and this uh, new vehicle launch logistics design can happen up to one year and one year and a half before the launch for a, a smooth uh, actual launch. And also we have the topics of vehicle handover and uh, fleet management services, because that trend of uh, new business models with the fleet management and leasing is important. And we see that with uh, our uh, uh, vehicles uh, in DHL, where we have a fleet of uh, uh, around 100,000 uh, vehicles directly controlled, where it is important to care about vehicle handover and pickup logistics, the predictive maintenance for uptime optimization, because here we talk not just about cars, but we talk about assets. Uh, importantly, also to care about the logistics of the maintenance and, and, and cleaning of the vehicles in the same way as the repositioning. And so that's very uh, important. And we see examples of that in several uh, emerging markets uh, in the Middle East, but also uh, another example in Rwanda with uh, Volkswagen having a new uh, business model uh, and really um, uh, caring about uh, uh, building an ecosystem for uh, Volkswagen uh, vehicles uh, with uh, production, new car sales, ride hailing, car sharing, used car sales, parts and services uh, uh, caring, uh, in order really to, to care for some gaps uh, in terms of uh, ride hailing services, for example, in the market and also partnerships with the likes uh, of Siemens uh, for the feasibility of electromobility there. So you can see really all kinds of things, you know, uh, happening and, and, and getting more and impo more important in different parts uh, of the world. And of course, when we talk about the transformation of aftermarket and e-commerce, we talk more about 
on-demand uh, service on the rise, consolidation in the value chain with uh, more mergers, new aftermarket business opportunities with uh, electric uh, vehicles and tech equipments, like for example, the advanced driver assistance systems and all kind of tech equipments that are in fact uh, uh, having uh, the consequence that uh, technology is meeting uh, automotive to have what we may call auto tech or automobility. And that's why we change you know, our name from automotive to automobility in order to address uh, these important uh, trends. So there we see, of course, new uh, sales channels for past accessory and finished vehicles, more centralized distribution models with direct to dealer and garage deliveries. There are also opportunities here for shared distribution, combining brands uh, and, and channels, and also uh, an adaptation of processes and equip equipment to new products like batteries and technology parts. And eventually, when we want to balance costs and resiliency, we have a whole uh, journey to, to its resiliency where we visualize uh, what's happening in terms of potential risks in the network up to the shipment visibility. And we develop a tool for that and uh, also in partnership uh, where it is important to monitor the incidents, but also uh, having a supply and watch in order to understand what's the situation with the suppliers, because we see failures happening more and more in this area. Now it's important to have this visibility, to have this risk assessment, but it's important really to analyze the uh, situation and to act about it in order to mitigate uh, these situations. And here the importance of analytics, and I would say even uh, um, uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, systems that help to have adjusted, uh, for example, estimated times of arrivals and adjust the activities accordingly. So here we can see really the importance to have this um, risk management uh, system and approaches and associated tools. That led us to the development of uh, our thinking in terms of uh, all kinds of trends and their implications in terms of logistics and hence uh, uh, a very recent uh, white paper together with Neckerman Strategic Advisors uh, on uh, the uh, automobility value chain transformation or global automobility logistics networks. And we can see, for example, how the increase of the high tech components in cars is driving more dedication in terms of uh, supply chain uh, setups, for example, for semiconductors, uh, as well as EV and batteries. Uh, also uh, a change in terms of, or an evolution in terms of some transportation modes where we see more and more air freight uh, in uh, uh, automobility, uh, like, you know, we, we see it in a big way with uh, tech. And we, that was also, uh, something we've seen uh, during also this uh, pandemic. And of course, shorter product life cycles driven by the technology content uh, of all kinds of parts that also drives more uh, launches and uh, the related logistics for new vehicle launches. An important uh, trend we've seen there is also the need for sustainable uh, supply chains and, and in a way that meets nicely the target of um, zero emissions for DHL in 2050. Uh, but by 2025, we will increase already our carbon efficiency by 50% over 2007. We've already exceeded the 30%. We also see that 70% of our uh, own first and last man services will have uh, clean pickup and, and delivery solutions and that 50% of our sales eventually will incorporate green solutions. And there are different ways to do that in terms of burn and clean, less and burn clean uh, vehicles and solutions. Uh, in terms of multimodal and flexible networks, 
for, of course, cost optimization, but definitely CO2 optimization, big data for optimization in order, for example, to optimize the routings and also autom automation for waste reduction between the four walls in terms of systems for energy optimizations, use of alternative energies, but also outside the four walls. Now, when we talk about multimodal and flexible networks, we see the rise of what we call logistics as a service. You all know mobility as a service, but there is logistics as a service, and typically with a, a digital freight platform that we've developed uh, in a startup uh, uh, called Saludo, and that connects shippers and couriers that gives free access to a wide range of certified transport service providers uh, that can uh, easily submit their shipping details and requests connected to uh, uh, careers uh, that, uh, where there is free access to FTL shipments from re reliable shippers and real-time market data to help make uh, more competitive uh, uh, transport uh, offers. So this is important and also there's a key element there that's the element of reliability because uh, uh, the couriers need to be uh, qualified in terms of service equipment uh, and quality of course gets uh, more important and we see really a, really a rise of these services in emerging markets uh, uh, like turkey uh, where really there is a big demand for for that uh, also, we, we've seen also in terms of sustainability, the importance of big data and optimization, uh, and that really helps um, uh, changing and improving the route optimization and, of course, decreasing the number of kilometers or miles uh, uh, that are crossed. And, and that uh, helps, of course, in terms of CO2 optimization. Uh, here we have a startup. A green plan that developed a really powerful algorithm for the task of moving goods but also people in an efficient and clean way and that uh, algorithm optimized routes of last mile delivery and road freight uh, operation and it, it is very relevant and uh, we, we could see that by the number of users of this uh, solution the last times and the uh, very recent award, the Post-Europe Innovation Award for 2020. So what we can see is that this pandemic does not only present us with a unique challenge, but it's also an opportunity uh, to uh, fundamentally rethink our supply chains for, of course, cost optimization, but very importantly for the now and the future for resiliency. I would like to thank you now for your attention. Hello and welcome to our live Q&A. Uh, thank you Subash and thank you Fatih for this great presentation, very insightful and thank you for being here with us today. So, and thank you for everyone who is, uh, who is watching us. We, we have already uh, a few questions. Um, so, uh, first question is already on the screen, and um, Fatih and Subash, you can uh, you can address that. Uh, what is your view on the hyperloop? How far do we expect this mobility tech to succeed to support eco-friendly mobility, or is it going to be just a dream? Subash, maybe you want to go first. Thank you, Alice. Alex, quite interesting question. Um, well, uh, when we talk about uh, specifically UAE, um, if you take my perspective and our discussion with uh, uh, many organizations who are involved in uh, developing the Hyperloop, definitely going to become a reality. It will take time. Uh, we have UAE as a country already started uh, with, tri with trials of Uber bike, and we are, we are expecting flying taxis, flying Airbus to come soon. And we are expecting these to happen in next four to five years. Uh, but Hyperloop definitely 10 years, 15 years away from now. And the way the country uh, has developed its vision, going to become a, th these concepts of mobility definitely going to become a reality soon. OK, thank yes. you. Well, on my side, I would say that uh, in the US, uh, definitely, I mean, there were things you know that started uh, 
to happen in terms of trials. But I think that uh, in places like Dubai, we may see really fast technology jumps. So I would see that happening uh, faster, definitely in Dubai or as Subar said, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, as me based in Dubai, I'm looking forward to, to that technology here, definitely. Um, so our next question, uh, e-commerce growth has benefited from the lockdown in many sectors. Will that be the same in auto? And what does that imply for logistics? Fatih, would you like to take that one? Yeah, um, e-commerce is actually already very important for auto in the sense that, you know, there are in the world more than 15 billion euros uh, up to even 20 billion euros now, especially with the pandemic uh, of business in e-commerce related to uh, auto components, uh, accessories, uh, but uh, we, we also see more and more tires uh, being shipped online. Uh, and it's not just, you know, what people have in mind in terms of direct to consumer that we have already, uh, but in, in uh, of emerging markets, what uh, is also a, a B2B, so that the dealers. And, and, and this put in terms of uh, brand protection and, uh, and also terms of um, more protection versus the, the gray market. Yeah. So I see uh, more on the increase. Certainly in the markets where there is uh, uh, an infrastructure uh, um, uh, along that. Perfect. Thank you, Fatih. Um, so we have a question on the shipping of uh, lithium batteries. So um, is there a way, in your opinion, that we can make that um, shipping of lithium batteries easier, more flexible? Uh, you know, um, the lithium batteries, they are under s some classifications as dangerous goods, as you know. Now, uh, a way, I mean, it's definitely packaging. I mean, it's, uh, and certainly, uh, if you, um, uh, you, you have used batteries, you know, you have no other way than, you know, to ship them uh, with a specific packaging. But even if they are new, I think that that's uh, also something uh, important. Then also, you know, a way to ship them in, this, in cells, different cells, and, and where you, you, you start to ship your, your battery in different parts, because then uh, that also something that, you know, helps also, uh, also with also some classifications and the way you send it. So th there are different methods uh, that are being used at the moment under different modes. Uh, and, and, and this is definitely in the making because there are also different regulations according to the countries. And I have to say that we've learned a lot uh, through our um, involvement uh, with Formula E. Uh, as you know, for years also we, we, we are with Formula E and we, we managed to really to learn a lot about uh, the shipments in, under different conditions. Uh, it can be temperature, humidity, whatever. Uh, see all kind of movements because that's if there is a winner uh, during this pandemic it's definitely electrification and we see also that even in some uh, elections like in the US you know uh, uh, electrification uh, attached to sustainability is a big theme so uh, so and and, and hence it in the safest way uh, and, 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 and of course, you know, all the work we do in terms of uh, packaging there is very important. Great, thank you Fatih. Um, the next question, it's already on the screen. Um, uh, uh, Subhash, I think that uh, can also be addressed to you. How do you see the pace of introduction of EVs compared to Europe and North America? Will the GCC electrify faster? Well, when we uh, specifically talk about EVs in GCC or larger uh, Middle Eastern countries, we have countries like UAE, Jordan. They have specifically come up with policies supporting uh, EV infrastructure. 
and uh, the UAE alone, I mean, such a small country, has more than 725 charging stations. If you look at the footprint per kilometer, that is much more higher than many countries globally. So definitely, when it comes to sustainability, the electrification, UAE is the one who is being uh, uh, the front runner in this race. And then we have Jordan, who has defined the incentive packages. Recently, we had Egypt. Qatar last month came up with a strategy. They have came up with a plan that they want to uh, provide, they want to actually convert their public transport system, buses and vans, to electric vehicles, to autonomous driving. Most of these, these, most of the GCC countries on the passenger transport side, they are moving towards that. The one thing which which is not is still so visible and expected to be visible in next few years are the incentives because incentives are very very limited in many European countries and US. We see tax incentives, but we literally don't have much taxes in in UAE in Oman. Uh, taxes are in the range of five to fifteen percent, and that's where we will see development happening. Now Saudi is talking about the EV strategy. They are planning to develop the entire value chain, just not the vehicle sales, but we would hear in a couple of years what they are planning in terms of assembling some of the vehicles in, in Saudi to, uh, uh, to put that infrastructure in place in the newly developed cities. So definitely EV is going to be successful in GCC. However, incentive will still play a major role. We have seen the success of Tesla, we have seen success uh, model of some of other brands. If I take an example of self drive, they have specifically introduced EVs on their subscription model. And that was one of the uh, model which was, uh, I mean, they had more than 100 or 120 booking in a day when they put that EV model on the subscription services. So there is a customer demand, there is a requirement, and EV is definitely future for countries like UAE, Jordan, Egypt, Qatar, Saudi, and Oman going forward. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. And um, uh, the question is, the automobility industry is under cost pressure today and looking for savings. What technologies do you see as the most relevant? And will digitalization be enough to provide expected savings? Um, Fatih, maybe that's for yeah. you. Yeah, uh, definitely digitalization uh, is key, and we see it already in terms of communication. If you would not, being becoming even more important in emerging markets uh, in terms of risk management solutions. Uh, so we we work currently on on several uh, risk management solutions. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, really uh, live monitoring of, of different uh, categories of risks, uh, also in terms of contingency planning, and we will see more of the artificial intelligence uh, being implemented uh, behind uh, risk management uh, in order to improve the adjusted estimated times of arrivals uh, based on so all kind of uh, events they can be uh, political events, they can be uh, uh, natural events, they can be strikes, social events happening. So th this is uh, something we'll see because the just-in-time model now is under uh, threat, you know, because of the current uh, environment and also maybe the future uh, situations we are going to see. Uh, also, we also see, uh, you know, the rise of uh, uh, logistics as a service uh, besides, uh, we've seen mobility as a service, but logistics as a service becoming important. Uh, these uh, platforms like Saludo, where you know you as uh, shippers with the uh, service providers, uh, because thanks to these kind of platforms, uh, you have an, uh, an assurance, you know, that you have much better quality. Uh, in terms of uh, service providers behind these platforms, certainly uh, in logistics, uh, and you can really qualify these service uh, providers in terms also of equipment. So this is also an important area we will see. Plus all the areas uh, li related to uh, all kind of sanitary measures like social distancing uh, in the warehouses, in the operations, 
uh, that are digitally enhanced that we are going to see. Besides all what is related to uh, systems uh, for inbound to manufacturing, yard management, uh, where, uh, of course, digitalization makes uh, uh, a difference. So definitely it's there, it will be there, and it will just get enhanced, and it will be uh, further enhanced with uh, all what we see in terms of machine learning and artificial intelligence, things that are already more and more uh, in place. Thank you, Fatih. Uh, Subhash, any, any inputs from your side on this one? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, when we talk about the online retailing or e-commerce or related things, uh, specifically talking about Middle East and the automotive industry, the changes which we have seen in last two to three years has been, uh, I mean, I can, if, I, if I can use the word brilliant, then I would use that because we have seen decline in automotive industry since 2016, 17, 18, and 19, the industry started coming back to normal. And then in 2020, we had the COVID come in. And, and that's where, because, because if you look at the, uh, the overall uh, system in, in GCC, most of the goods are being bought nowadays online with soup.com, with Amazon, with Desert Cart, a lot of those platforms, they are already providing those services to customer. So customer is already looking for convenience, but automotive industry, that ecosystem were not there. So customer wants a convenience, but the, the industry hasn't adopted that. And that's what got developed in last few years. We had, we have many aggregator platforms now who are aggregating the service demand, aggregating the parts demand, aggregating the accessories demand, and customer can order them and can have it at their home. But what changed during COVID that it directly took the fourth gear from the first gear. And that's where most of development, most of improvement has happened. Earlier, if I want to repair my car at my home, I can't hire a mechanic who can come to my home and repair it. But today it's possible, I can do it. I can order a tire online, the company will come to my place, the van will come to my place and they will replace the tire. Similarly, they will replace the brake, brake pads. They will do a lot of those things and all that is possible now. So Middle East has a reason been very conventional, but thankfully it is changing now. And e-commerce and retail sector, that is what is bringing those changes. Earlier, we were expecting that e-commerce growth would be about 20, 25%. But in the last six to seven months, we have already seen more than 60% growth in transaction. Automotive retail transaction was about two to 3%. In the last six months, that has gone to 12 to 13% in terms of total value of transaction in UAE and Saudi Arabia. So that's, that's a big change. Yeah. Um, I would like to add something. Sure. We use the mobile phones uh, as a communication platform. We'll see an incredible rise throughout Africa and Middle East. Uh, it's like really an incredible technology jump that really makes a difference. And, and, and I think that, you know, this is really, uh, really going to make a difference. The mobile phones as either professionally or, or personally will really make a difference. And, and we see that happening. Uh, already in several uh, African countries, besides, of course, the Middle East. Yeah. I feel I feel we would need more time to go on with this uh, discussion, which is very interesting. Unfortunately, we already uh, have passed uh, our time for this Q and A. Which uh, thank you for for the questions we received. Um, thank you, Fatih. Thank you, Subash, for your contribution. It has been great. Um, and thank you so much for everyone who is watching us. I hope and we hope that you are enjoying as well the virtual trade fair, that you have had a chance to scroll around the, the different booths and different topics that we have there, quite some interesting content for you to download, for you to watch some videos. So if you have had the chance yet, so go into the virtual trade fair. Um, tomorrow we have another presentation on the oil and energy sector at the same time. So uh, please tune in tomorrow again. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you so much, Fatih. Thank you, Subash. And uh, we will speak soon again, hopefully.
Thank you, Alice. Thank, Thank you, Patrick. You.